welcome Dr. Monika Haut. Good morning, everyone, and a very warm welcome from my side as well. Thank you, Lisa, for inviting me and for giving me the opportunity to tell you all why I am so passionate and also so compassionate about the fashion industry. Well, the word fashion evokes different, different feelings to different people. Some get excited, think about glamour, creativity, and fun. Others find the industry trivial, superficial, elitist. And then you have others who feel that they don't belong to the industry and they think that they shouldn't care. Well, indeed, you should care because fashion industry is one of the biggest industries in the world. Indeed, it was also one of the fastest growing industries due to digitization and globalization. If you think alone, the jeans industry, the worldwide jeans industry, is bigger than worldwide music industry. So it gives a perspective of the, of the size of the industry. The industry is also a very powerful industry. It can make us dream. It can even create needs that we never had. Right? So fashion is very much embedded in our everyday life in our upbringing, in our childhood, in our social and also job context. The first thing what we do in the morning is actually think what we will be wearing today, right? So that's the first decision that we make every single day. We communicate through the clothes we wear and clothes we wear have a very powerful message that we are sending to the outside. However, our wardrobes often don't match our values. And fashion industry, how beautiful and glamorous it is, it is also full of contradictions. And it was often not using its power for the source of good. It made very few people very, very wealthy and left many suffering. It also contributed to a major economic divide, which we know, which is getting bigger and bigger. So even the legendary designer Karl Lagerfeld says, if you want so social justice, be a public servant. Fashion is ephemeral, dangerous, and unfair. Indeed, millions of people work in the industry, and 80% of them are women. Fashion, and especially fast fashion, is also a feminist issue. Because a lot of these women who work in the fashion industry, uh, there's a lot of uh, gender inequality. Gender inequality on the top level, on the design, on management side, but also on the floors of factory workers. So there's millions of women who are constantly risking their lives and often are being paid below the living wages for working in the fashion industry. But the paradox is we are women who actually fuel the industry. We make decisions for ourselves, decisions for our children, even sometimes for our husbands. Fashion industry is also very resource intense industry. The amount of water, the amount of pesticides being used in the industry is humongous. And the statistics speak for themselves. Fashion industry is also one of the main contributors to microplastics in our oceans. So the topic which we hear very often today. Indeed, United Nations says that the carbon emissions of fashion industry are larger than that of all international flights and shipping industry. Which is crazy if you think about it. We are complaining so much about flying, but what about the fashion industry? The question is, how did we get here? I think none of the designers and none of the brands wanted to contribute to creating so much harm. I think we are all guilty, and I'm guilty as well. And I'm very guilty <laughs> of, of all these, these issues which I was talking about. So the fashion industry is very close to my heart because I basically grew up working in the industry 
and I want to walk you through my life and different encounters I had with the industry, tell you how I lost passion for it, and then how I gained my passion and compassion for the industry again. So I was born in this small country, uh, Lithuania, which is close to the Baltic Sea, um, and I was born still in the Soviet times. So if some of you recall, in the Soviet times, it was very, very difficult to get anything fashionable. Nobody could get their hands on the jeans. It was literally hard to get any uh, interesting clothing. After the breakdown of Soviet Union, Lithuania was doing really badly economically. So although the Western markets opened and we could have access to the Western goods, nobody could really afford them. So I grew up wearing the sweaters knitted by my mother and dresses made by a local tailor. My mother, she never read Vogue or Elle, but I still remember it very, very well how excited she got when she got a new uh, issue of Borda magazine. <laughs> and she really took good care of these magazines. So yeah. So, what strikes me most is really scarcity fostered a lot of creativity. Because not only clothing were scarce, also nice fabrics or yarn was scarce. So old sweaters would be torn apart and new sweaters would be made. A dress of my mother would be torn apart and she would make a new dress for me maybe, right? And I think the amount of creativity uh, she put in, in this work was amazing. And I think in general, even in our times, creativity, uh, sorry, scarcity can foster creativity. So being a tall Eastern European, I was approached by a model agency when I was 15 to go and work to Milan um, in the fashion industry, which I did. And I did enjoy the industry. I met very many creative people, which influenced my style making. I traveled the world for six years and really enjoyed that. But when I look back, it really got me thinking that I was constantly in touch with fashion, but I was never really thinking about the people who were making the clothes. So all the scandals back in the days in early 2000 was about drugs and skinny models, but nobody talked about the people in the, in the sweat factories. So after six years, I met my husband and settled down here in Dusseldorf and left fashion industry and started to study. Um, oops. Yeah. Um, indeed, I studied business administration and I thought I will never come back to fashion industry again. You know, I thought that the, the days are over. But nevertheless, I did enjoy fashion. I still like dressing up, right? Uh, I still had, had, had joy in, the, in, in closing. And I think, oops, many of you would agree. I mean, many of you know these sayings. Give a girl the right shoes and she can conquer the world, right? You all know that sometimes we say we are bored and we go shopping. And indeed, this is what I did as well. And being a student, I also started to indulge myself in fast fashion. So for better or for worse, fast fashion actually democratized the fashion industry because it allowed everyone, despite of their social status or their income, to communicate for clothing, right? So no matter who you were, you could dress and you could express yourself the way you wanted. So what happened next? Um, I think we got to the point where shopping became a socially justifiable hobby, right? If you meet your girlfriends, let's say, let's go shopping. What you will do on the weekend, I will go shopping. So we shopped so much and we started enjoy sales. I mean, who doesn't know the Black Fridays? I mean, there's so much buzz about it in the, in the, in the, in the recent years. And what strikes me the most that we, went, we got to the point where we feel stupid to pay a full price. You know, why should I pay the full price for a garment or a pair of shoes if three months later I can get it uh, 
for, for quarter of the price. So it really damaged the industry, but also our mentality, the way we actually shop for fashion and the way we value fashion. So what happened from the year 2000 to 2014, the production of garments more than doubled. And actually, I don't know where we are even now in 2020, because the numbers are just increasing and increasing and increasing with India and China getting into the, getting the middle class ready and who are also hungry for fast fashion. So also my closet was growing. So from having a small closet while growing up in Lithuania, expanding my closet while model times, and then really embracing fashion industry, it got bigger and bigger and bigger. But I still enjoyed shopping, so I would still go and shop to the point where I had no place where to put my clothes. I started buying new closets. And this really got me thinking because fashion industry was built on selling false promises to women, right? Because we thought that consumption would make us happy and indeed it didn't. I wasn't happy with my big closet full of fancy dresses Actually, I felt quite frustrated because I didn't know what to wear in the morning. And I think many of you can relate to this most probably. So a couple of years later, I decided to pursue a PhD in innovation and entrepreneurship at WHU Otto Beisam School of Management. And I was doing my uh, PhD on the topic of open innovation. I looked at different industries and how do they embrace collaborative and open innovation. And I came fast to realize that fashion was not a very open industry. It was not a very collaborative industry. It was a very secretive industry and didn't really like to share information or, or innovation. But what really struck me even more that if you look at the supply chain from the beginning till the end, there was very, very little innovation happening at the beginning of a supply chain. So innovation was really following the money in the fashion industry, and we had a lot of innovation happening at the end of a supply chain. So innovation targeted to, towards consumers. We had online platforms, same-day delivery, you know, customization, uh, virtual reality all aimed at selling more and more stuff to us, to the consumers. And over the last 10 years, the way the clothes are being actually produced, the way we make actual garments, <coughs> has barely changed. So the only thing what really changed is the geographical location of a production. So whereas before fashion was maybe made in New York, Milan, and other big European or American metropolis cities, the production moved first to China, India, Bangladesh, and now it's even moving to Africa. Because there is no incentive to really innovate because we can always find people who can produce fashion cheaper and cheaper. And manually operated uh, sewing machine is still the primary means by which clothing are being made, which, which was the same 100 years ago. So then this happened. How many of you know the incident? How many of you heard of this incident? Wow, not bad, not bad. That makes me happy. Um, so in 2013, a building, a garment factory collapsed uh, in Bangladesh, killing more than 1,000 people. It was clear that the building was unsafe. However, the people were forced to go in and work. And the uh, security uh, exits were closed and the building collapsed, leaving a lot of people injured and killing a lot of people as well. So, this really was something that the, that the world could not ignore anymore. I mean, we always heard that there were a lot of small and bigger stories in, with the garment workers, but that really was something that everybody saw. And two designers in, um, in the UK decided to do something. They decided to raise awareness of actually um, who is producing our clothing. 
because a lot of young people don't even know that. Some people think that clothes come out of a machine. They just, you know, spit them out, and, you know, we are living in the digital times. Um, so they founded a movement called Fashion Revolution. How many of you know Fashion Revolution? Okay, not bad as well. So these two ladies took a very open approach. They created a lot of informational material. They created a lot of design content. Also these posters, who made my clothes, and they put them all available on the online, which was a really not a typical um, thing to do in the fashion industry. And they asked all of us, all consumers, to take this poster, wear our favorite garment inside out, and tag the brand which was making it, and ask who made my clothes. So by, by doing so, a lot of brands got a lot of pressure. And also we got a lot of buzz on social media because a lot of people indeed picked up on the, on the topic. And Fashion Revolution now is the largest social movement campaigning for sustainability in the fashion industry. They're doing a really great job and if you have time to donate and support them, please do so because these people are forcing the industry to change. You can also follow them. So living in Dusseldorf, in a city which is actually known for fashion, right? Um, my friend Annie and myself, we were a bit confused because nobody was really talking about the topic. And while fashion revolution movements spread all over the world, there were a lot of cities with representatives of fashion revolution, nobody was talking about it here in Dusseldorf. And we said we have to do something, and we decided to become the city ambassadors of the fashion revolution movement. Which I think was quite bizarre because none of us was working in fashion. Anya is a banker, and me, I was a researcher. For better or worse, I think we opened the topic to a very diverse public, right? Uh, we started organizing events. I think some people might even recognize themselves here. I saw, I saw some guests, guests uh, who, who joined us as well here to, uh, today. Um, so we started organizing diverse events, raising awareness of the topic, but also promoting innovators and entrepreneurs who are working and making the change in the industry. Indeed, the change started to happen because more and more brands became transparent. If you look now, there are more and more brands who actually display their supplier list on the online and who actually make it available to everybody. There's more and more brands who actually go to the factories and make pictures of their employees uh, with a poster, I made your clothes. And if we look at the impact that Fashion Revolution achieved, it is quite amazing because from 2015 to 2018, more and more brands actually responded to these questions on social media, who made my clothes, with posting their employees with a poster, I made my clothes. <coughs> so a lot has happened since Rana Plaza, and brands are getting more transparent. We have a lot of great entrepreneurs and innovators working to change the industry. But the problems are still there. Just about a good month ago, there was another tragedy in a the, in the factory. Over 40 people were burned alive. So the industry is not changing so fast. And that's why I want to ask you as well, don't stop asking, right? Because there's still a lot of work to be done. And even if you're not big on social media, you can still ask in the shops. If you go to the shop and before buying something, you ask the shopkeeper, where, where was this garment made? What is it made out of? It makes a, a difference because if more and more people ask, the pressure for the industry will really rise. So yeah, my story, coming back to, to my story and, uh, and fashion. Um, joining Fashion Revolution fundamentally changed the way I see and the way I buy fashion. And I think 
since being an ambassador, I barely, I pretty much changed my complete shopping behavior. I barely buy anything. And I really love the quote of Orsola de Castro, which is the co-founder of Fashion Revolution. She says, the most sustainable garment is the one actually that you already have in your wardrobe, right? And I think many of us maybe have a similar story like I do with wardrobes getting bigger and bigger and bigger, right? So what I start doing, uh, really use what you have, right? I mean, we need to get more creative. We need to look, as we, we need to give a second look to our wardrobes and see what we actually have. We can borrow, we can swap. Swap parties are a new big thing and we're organizing one in April, so stay tuned. <laughs> I also stopped shopping online. It saved me a lot of time because I would spend two, three hours each week just browsing on the online stores. I started repairing and upcycling. It indeed can be a lot of fun, and it gives a lot of joy and satisfaction once you are able to change your garments. And growing up in Lithuania, indeed, I learned the skill of fixing and knitting, which back then I was not really valuing, and I do now today. Finally, there's a lot of secondhand shops, and secondhand is really booming as well. Uh, so, so, so. Shopping secondhand is a very good alternative. And then finally, buying. If you really need to buy something, think twice. Try to buy more local and stop the hunts for the, for the sales. Because what we are doing, we are not respecting the people who are producing the garments. Because it can, cannot be fair that a cup of latte costs the same as, as a t-shirt, right? And if we respect a designer here in Dusseldorf who has been working and producing a garment and we still want to have this 50% off, I mean, if we would do it in every industry, if we would go to a doctor, if we would, we would go to the museum, and, we, and if we would always ask for 50% off, I mean, that, that wouldn't be fair. And I think none of us would like to be working on such, such a conditions. So yeah, indeed, the change is happening. Um, I just came back from uh, the Berlin Fashion Week, and it seems that really for the first time in the industry, it is fashionable to be sustainable. So there's some greenwashing happening, of course, but the industry is awakening. And Fashion Revolution did some statistics which shows that sustainable business can also be a good business. Because if we look at it, uh, especially the younger generation, the millennials, the Generation Z, they are the ones who actually want to have, once they buy clothing, they, they, wanna, they care about um, social impact and also about the environmental impact. Also, the high earners, they are the ones who want to buy more sustainable products. So it shows that you know, th the profits are moving in this direction. Second hand. There are estimates that the second-hand market will actually overtake the fast fashion industry in the foreseeable future. And this is thanks to online platforms and startups like Vino Kilo who are making second-hand indeed trendy again. So it's interesting to see what's, what's happening in the industry. And the industry is going not only through digital disruption, like many industries today, it is really going for a major cultural disruption, for really consumer-driven revolution, which is forcing the brands to reconsider their practice. And for this reason, just very, very recently, we founded a platform here for Dusseldorf, which is called Change Room. And with Change Room, we want to reimagine the fashion industry in Dusseldorf because we think that we can do better than just buy fast fashion, or maybe stay in the queues in front of a designer shops just to get in. Yeah. <laughs> so I think many of you would agree that fashion is a form of art, but I think the way we have been using uh, fashion, it was very, very different. In fashion industry, art, let's say, music or, um, or paintings were used to bring people together, 
to unite communities, which fashion never did. Fa fashion was based on jealousy, on secrecy, on scarcity. So we are trying to reimagine the industry which indeed unites communities, which indeed brings people closer together. Yeah, so we recently launched a project um, with Dusseldorf-based designer, uh, a designer, <laughs> talking too much about designers, uh, with Dusseldorf-based photographer, Falco Peters. It's a photo and video series uh, called Naked Garments. And with this photo series, we want to portray different people from the city of Dusseldorf, be it social entrepreneurs, be it designers, be it business people, be it change makers, you name it, and really ask them to talk about a favorite piece of clothing, right? To tell a personal story why this piece of clothing is important to them and why they care about that piece of clothing. And we are very happy to have Dr. Vera Geisel, who was our first model, and the interview is coming, and the picture is actually still not online, so you are the first ones to see it, indeed. <laughs> um, the interview is going live in two weeks online, uh, so um, Dr. Vera Geisel will be talking about her relationship to fashion and about her favorite clothing and how does she care about clothing. And we really hope that these stories can maybe connect people because stories resonate. And I think all of us maybe have a piece of garment which we really love, which has a personal story, and which makes us want to keep that garment for, for way longer and actually care about that garment. Another issue what we are working on is repairs. Because Greenpeace said that indeed 50% of all Germans has never repaired a piece of garment. So we maybe forgot the skill, maybe also lost the interest, because buying new is indeed cheaper than repairing, and we're working on changing that mindset. And so we are in pretty much in the business of changing culture. And as you know, changing culture can be very, very difficult, and it can take time. But we think it's worth it, and we think it's worth it to give it a try. So to really sum it up, uh, fashion and roots, what I would like you to remember after this talk. That, first of all, origin. Every piece of garment has been made by real hands. So has been made by hundreds of hands. Sometimes that piece of garment traveled all around the world until it finally reached your home. Culture. So culture plays a very important role on our shopping decisions. And sometimes we make unconscious de decisions in the way we behave or in the way we buy or in the way we dress. So really consider that and, and, and reflect on that. And finally, stories. Uh, because clothing, we make stories while wearing clothing. S clothing is our second skin, right? Um, so I really encourage you to make more stories with your favorite pieces of garment. Take care better of your, of your, of, of your clothes. And yeah, we are still in the beginning of a year. And if you still don't have a New Year's resolution, I hope that consuming fashion more sustainably could be a one. So to conclude, I have a beautiful uh, quote from Vivian Westford who says, fashion is very important. It is life enhancing. And like everything that gives pleasure, it is worth doing well. Thank you. <laughs>